Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first edition of the Scientific Coaching Podcast. I am your host, Lucas Berry, along with my co-host, the one, the only, the GOAT now that Brady is gone, Darren Shrewsbury Jr. Howdy. How's it going? That was really underwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm known for that sometimes. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> well, Darren, this is about the third or fourth time I've tried to get you on a show with me, and it finally worked. <laughs> Yeah. So, so thanks for jumping on and doing this. Definitely. This is going to be fun. We're going to try to do this as long as time and schedules allow. Obviously, I – well, I don't know. Obviously, I am not working now because I've been out of a job for a while, and I'm not about to go and try to get one being an at-risk person with this coronavirus. Darren, by virtue of having WBU go to online classes, has seen his schedule open up dramatically. Mm-hmm. So we've got time to do this, and uh, we wanted this. I think this really stems from me asking you to do it, but I think it was it was me talking about or thinking about, and then eventually talking about to you uh, all the experiences we've had as WVU fans and New England Patriot fans throughout the years. You know, we've, we've known each other for what five, six years now, at least six. Yeah, yeah. So we've known each other a while, but we were both WBU and Patriots fans long before we knew each other. And so we've, we've kind of grown up in that. So we, we have opinions on both teams. We have memories of both teams. And I think we are uniquely qualified to speak on both teams, if you want to call it that. Probably a good way to put it. Well, Darren, first of all, let's let's talk about the name of the show, uh, Scientific Coaching. It's a homage to Bill Belichick and Neil Brown. It's also – I thought about this earlier. I don't know if we talked about this or not, but my nickname is Coach. Mm-hmm. For the longest time, I have been fascinated with the coaching profession, learning about different schemes and strategies surrounding the game of football. I've loved it. And you are in grad school to be a professional scientist. I think it fits. Yeah, Correct. So that's it, – it's, it's, we tried a lot to get um, a name. We had, what, Pat's Mountain, I think, because we were going to do this for both West Virginia and the New England Patriots, and mm-hmm. I, I presented that. I kind of liked it. Then I was like, we need to stop thinking about both teams and just find a common ground. And, well, Bill Belichick is a bona fide genius, and Neil Brown is one of the up-and-coming geniuses in college football. In fact, I think he was named in the uh, athletic, had a uh, uh, coach's draft a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. I think Neil Brown was on that list of the top coaches in college football, despite a 5-7 and seven year last year. I mean, he was also one of the top coaches under 40, right, or under 45? Under 45, yeah. I think was the, cat- the category they used, uh, which I can't remember what uh, article or publication put that out, but... I do recall that, which again, like you said, is kind of surprising considering five and seven year. But what how, what he did and how he did that, despite having the record, is still shows some uh, things to look forward to. I think what he did at Troy, you can see really just you can kind of see okay, he's going he's going to win. That's that's not an up for debate. He's going to win. Mm-hmm. The f- you made me think of something, and I and you know how I am. I generally think of something and go with it. You know who the youngest head coach is in FBS right now? I have no clue. Sean Lewis, head coach at Kent State. Hmm. He's 31 years old. Edelman's alma mater. Ha-ha. He was hired in, uh, in 2018 is when I see this article. So we'll go with that. Uh so yeah, Kent State. Kent State didn't do all that bad last year. I mean, they weren't great by any means, but they didn't do all that horribly, as best I recall. For those of you who don't know or may remember from uh, the previous iteration of this show, which was my own show, the Luke's Look podcast, I have a I buy Phil Steele's uh, college football preview magazine, and I record every score of every FBS game in it. So I remember pretty doggone well what happened to with most teams, although sometimes the details are a bit sketchy because it's 130 teams in FBS and it gets really, really long after a while. <laughs> but let's move on. Let's talk about the big story around the sporting world, which is the shutdown of the sporting world, except for the NFL draft. In the WNBA draft last week, uh, the COVID-19 
pandemic. Let's talk about that, Darren. As the scientific voice in this, I will let you take the lead on this. What is your what's your overall thought of sports and COVID nineteen? It's a very broad question, but what's yeah. your overall thought? I mean, obviously, when we when we first saw all this happen, and you know, it was starting to become apparent that that it was becoming an outbreak in China. We were like, okay, you know cool and you know based on the information we all well not cool but based on the information we we had we were like okay well this might not be anything to worry about at this moment but the the moment we started seeing it spread then everyone almost immediately started deciding we need to shut everything down and by that we mean sports the the march madness like what a week before march madness was set to start march madness canceled uh, we can't, we don't declare a champion, and well, the NBA, you know, cancels their their season, and they just fall like dominoes, and then you start seeing almost immediately after that, NBA players start testing positive, um, so it makes you wonder if we hadn't if we hadn't closed down that quickly, how many more people we might see with this infection, because. You know, we had what was it? A few of the was it the jazz? A few jazz players? Yeah, tested think, positive. Yeah, and you know how many people regularly show up to an NBA game and maybe contact, maybe have a chance to to get pictures or get things signed by chance, and then obviously all the other players go back home. Um, so it was it was a a necessary evil, an evil in the sense that we don't get to watch it anymore. Um, so it's been, it's been a very interesting thing to see play out, uh, for sure. And then, especially now that, uh, we've seen some people take it on them themselves to what some players have actually started streaming themselves play against other players on other teams on NBA 2K or, or, uh, Madden 20, just try to keep some some sense of sports uh, in our lives at this point. Matt, uh, MLS actually did something called the MLS Tournament Challenge. It was the MLS players and EMLS players playing a two-legged affair uh, in a bracket thing on FIFA. They, advertised, they showed it on FS1 on Sunday. I watched my Galaxy lose to LAFC, and I got really mad in a virtual game. <laughs> Not sorry. Um, but to talk about the NBA, I would like to issue one correction as best I remember. The and a jazz player tested positive and then the league shut down. Okay. So it was it was pregame. They were getting ready to play, I think the the Oklahoma City Thunder, I want to say. Mm-hmm. And it was in Oklahoma City, and then I think it was Rudy Gobert, I want to say, got tested and got confirmed positive. And that's when I, and they called off the game, and that's when the NBA looked at this and said, Okay, we yeah. can't do this. Yeah, that's and right. the and and basketball is really interesting because everyone touches the same ball. Mm-hmm. It's why basketball players get sick during the season because everyone's touching the same ball. So if someone's sick, everyone's going to touch it. Mm-hmm. So that's what I thought of. And you mentioned how that would have gone. Yeah. In England, we saw cases. It's really bad in the UK. And I'm not putting all of this on one club or one game, but I'm saying it could have it could have been prevented to a certain degree. Atletico Madrid played at Liverpool uh, in the UEFA Champions League uh, before the UK shut the Premier League down. They had you had thousands of Spaniards coming over to watch the game, who said they weren't sick, and they didn't know it. And then they go and spread to Liverpool fans who go out everywhere and then spread it. And all next thing we know, it's spreading like wildfire. Mm-hmm. Who say that doesn't happen? So you're right. It's definitely a necessary evil. Uh, I don't like it. But I will say this. I will give credit. This is not a NASCAR podcast. I will give NASCAR credit. They have taken the lead in this, and they have done iRacing, which is effectively – it's not the same, but it's as close to the real projects you can get because you have real drivers doing it instead of watching an eSports player you know nothing about. Mm Mm-hmm. That's yeah. I, I give them credit for doing this. I don't know how – I almost wonder how the NFL will handle things that they have to cancel the season, what they will do. That will be a very a very good question. I have I have no idea what they would end up uh, – I, I, 
beats me. I want, and that's that moves me on to the next topic. Darren, on your gut, do you think we'll have a football season? Well, I I was quite optimistic for probably prior to midway last week, and then you start getting all of these people and their so, so-called protests, uh, if further endangering. That not only themselves, but a ton more people. And I would not be surprised and uh, take this with a grain of salt for anyone listening. Um, but I would not be surprised if we, we end up seeing a spikes in cases because of this. And that starts leading me be leading me to be a slight bit more pessimistic about the chances of, of sports and, and on that note as well, concerts, you know, we all like concerts. Uh, coming back as quickly, I I'm still hoping that that is the case that we do start seeing at least football season by by normally scheduled time. But if these shenanigans keep occurring, I'm going to become ever more pessimistic about that chance. I agree. I mean, I I I think there's the eternal optimist in me that says, "Oh, we're going to be fine." You know, what if I kept telling you we're going to be out of it by June? We're going to be into semi-normal life. And I'm not saying that we're going to be back filling stadiums and Gillette's going to be packed with the rafters or anything. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying we're going to be able to, I'm going to be able to go and see my girlfriend. You know, I'm going to be able to make that drive without having to worry about, okay, am I really supposed to be out here or not? You know, that's what I want <laughs> more than anything. I think it's just be able to go outside my house again. Yeah. And because I, like I said, I'm at risk. I don't go outside my house if I don't have to because I really do not want to catch this stuff. So that's that's what I that's my opinion on it. I don't have any hard evidence to support it. I look at numbers and I have a gut feeling, but that's all I can go on really because I'm not qualified to interpret numbers as well as you are. Also, for fun scientific Tom, since we were pretty much pulling out the or putting out the example there, um, the the term for an inanimate object that carries that can carry diseases in the case of our basketball example the basketball there's a term for that it's called uh, a fomite word of the day yep word, word of, of the, the day, day. <laughs> word of the day <laughs> it's quite a it's quite a fun word it's pretty much it's any inanimate object that can carry a virus which pretty much or a disease rather which is pretty much anything your tv your, your controller a basketball a your hockey knob, puck a hockey puck <laughs> The good thing those guys wear pads and the gold is wear gloves, so you don't have to have some dude out there just, you know, going at it. I actually didn't know this until a few weeks ago. The last NHL goaltender to not wear a mask played for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Hmm. I didn't know that. I think it was in the 70s they stopped that, and they were like, okay, you yeah. need to wear a mask. I would, I would have to question the sanity of anybody who, whose sole job is to prevent flying pieces of – I don't know, rubber and plastic. Frozen rubber. Yeah, getting shot at them, essentially, uh, and not wearing a mask. That I would have to question your sanity. Oh, those old guys, those old, old-time hockey players didn't wear masks, didn't wear helmets. They just went out there bare head. Uh, how and far that's why the come. NHL. That's why the NHL gained the reputation that it had for a rough league. And it, hockey is a rough sport, but it's a lot safer now. Yeah. So let's let's move on here. Let's talk about the NFL draft because that is the reason why we're recording today is that the NFL draft starts on Thursday. We're recording this on Tuesday. And we thought it would be a mixture in the NFL draft to me, and I'm gonna write a an article about this on my sports blog, Coach Barry College Football, uh that uh that the NFL is a draft is a perfect combination of college and professional. If you're a college fan, you can see these guys you watched the last four years going to the NFL, and if you're an NFL fan, you can look in and go, "Oh, you know who, who's the next who's the next batch of young talent." And if you love both like we do, you can kind of go, "Okay, where's my where are guys from my team gonna gonna fall in here, and where are guys from, team, from teams that we played the last four years gonna fall that we really liked seeing?" For West Virginia, that's Colton McKivitz. The Patriots took Yannick Just last year, the first West Virginia player on the Patriots roster since Tyler Urban was a backup, backup tight end many years ago. Uh, I don't think he stuck, stuck around very long, but I remember he was on the training camp roster at least. 
Um, but that's the main point I want to make of this is the NFL is doing this draft virtually. They're not having it in Las Vegas. Uh, Goodell will announce uh, uh, picks from his basement. Do you have a problem with the NFL holding a draft as if everything is quote unquote normal in all of this? I I see. So it, overall, I don't think that there's the the big problem in terms of hey, let's hold it. But I think there were st- a bunch of tiny problems that might not make it easy for everyone. For in, in the, I'll I'll break that down. Um, So the first issue probably being they've – most of the people drafting these these upcoming players are likely haven't seen much of them, especially since the Combine, and and especially for those who did not get to participate in the Combine. So you might see that they aren't able to make – the decisions maybe that they want to make because they don't, they have limited information on these pe- players now, most likely. Um, and I'm sure some people, I haven't actually looked this up to, to know whether or not they've done this, but I'm sure some players and some organizations might have found a way around this. Um, you know, maybe holding virtual workouts, uh, how that would work. I do not know, but maybe, maybe they found such a way to do that. Um, so, there's, there's probably obstacle number one right there. The obstacle number two is let's while they're actually holding the draft, uh, I could imagine a, a myriad of communication issues between managers, players, people, you know, the, the commissioner, uh, anyone associated with it. I feel like there are, there are likely to be some hiccups along the way. And that's expected, honestly, given that, I mean – I'll use a Discord regu- like once a week a- at least, and basically every single week it breaks up, and I have to restart the program, things like that. So whatever they end up using, I probably will have these same issues for. Um, but that might cause some some hiccups while that while I'm watching, and I'll be like, well, "Well, what's going on? Do these guys hear each other? Do I can't hear them? Do they know I can't hear them?" Um, and then I think. On the players' side of things, um, I could only imagine for for a lot of these players, especially the ones that are invited to be there in person on that first round, uh, they might have been looking forward to to walking up on that stage and uh, in front of everyone there, you know, getting cheered on, holding their jersey, and all of that. It's almost like a graduation moment in its own way, um, and a lot of them might not. You might miss out on that, or at least the proper experience, and that—that's more of a, a an emotional thing on the on their part, more than a practical problem. But you know, I'm sure that they they might be missing out on that, uh, and a lot of them might be very disappointed in that. I would like to raise two points. You talked about having virtual workouts. The New England Patriots are actually doing that. They're one of three teams. I have an article on here from NBC Sports Boston posted about 23 hours ago uh, that said the Patriots, the Bills, and the Colts are Uh going to be doing virtual workouts. I don't know. It doesn't say how they work, but they are doing it. So someone's going to find a way. Yes. And if you was going to be someone to find a way, you'd bet on Bill Belichick doing that. Absolutely. Uh, and they had a virtual, they had a mock draft yesterday for the NFL mm-hmm. so, so for everyone to get their ducks in a row before we start this for real and the, and the picks matter. There was a glitch on the first overall pick. When the Bengals picked, they had a glitch. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I found that interesting is that they didn't, they obviously don't want anyone to give away their information. So they picked former players. I kind of wonder if they got to the Patriots when they got to the Patriots choice, who they pick. Because I want to know if Bill took Brady. Or if, he, or if he took like Ty Law or Richard Seymour or some unknown seventh round draft pick that made like that didn't make the team in 2004. You know? Yeah. That is a. It's like, I, I wonder who they picked. Yeah, that, that would be just, just for sheer curiosity, that would be an interesting thing to know. That really would. Um, so, yeah, that. I agree with you that they're actually inviting some people to the draft. I think Joe Burrow and a few others are being invited, quote unquote, like they would have if the draft had been held. 
I don't know how that's going to work. I would imagine that they're going to have them in some sort of Zoom chat mm-hmm. with the commissioner. Yeah. And then they'll have uh, something, you know, like uh, you can have some interaction with them, I would guess. But that's just a pure fantasy guess. I have no idea how that will work. Another yeah. thing is that um, I lost. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. You know what we're losing in the draft that I'm really disappointed in losing? Um, I'm going to go on a limb here and say the colloquial booing of Roger Goodell, but... Uh... Um, <laughs> yes and no. That is true. But I'm also thinking Jets fans booing their pick. Ah, that, that as well. The That's question. tradition unlike any other. Yes. It, it always comes down to that. Whatever they do, they can... You could go. You could go back now and have Tom Brady be eligible for the NFL draft, and the Jets would pick Brady, and they would still boo. Am I wrong? I believe it. I, it, it it's crazy. So while I pull out my um, my notes of the Patriots depth chart, let's go into the big uh, discussion that I think could take us a little bit of while. What do the Patriots need in this draft? To you? Well, I think the the. The elephant in the room is more O-line depth. We have skilled players. They have uh, they have plenty of skilled players, but it seems like when that depth starts getting chipped away at, you, you could hardly believe that that's their players that should be on a Patriots roster sometimes. Um, and hopefully, with the with the um, hopeful. Uh, health of Yadni Kajust and, you know, should he remain on the team, that would probably help out a lot. Um, but I still think that's probably at least number one on my book is, is an offensive lineman. That would be probably be what I would pick first. Um, if I were in that, that war room. See, I, I, I like the offensive line. It's Joe Tooney, David Andrews, Shaq Mason, Marcus Cannon, and Isaiah Wynn. So from left to right, it's Isaiah Wynn, Joe Tooney, David Andrews, Shaq Mason, Marcus Cannon. That's not a bad offensive line. Dude, not at all. But the depth is what kills them because we've seen that every year there's always some lineman that goes down in like training camp or week two, and they've got to shuffle them around. And I think what will really be interesting is Dante Skarnecchia is not there anymore. He did retire the second time. So Dante Skarnecchia has been able to pull off miracles with that offensive line. He's not there anymore. We're going to have to find some guys that can play. So I, I agree with you uh, because, look, Brady was perfect at getting the ball out in like under two seconds. Mm-hmm. I don't know about Hoyer or Stidham doing that. I think they're capable of doing it, but I don't know that. So you're going to have to protect them a little bit more because you're not going to have one, two balls out anymore, at least not as much as you did with Brady. Exactly. And, and that also ties into the fact that neither of these – I mean, obviously Stid, uh, Stidham had been working with these receivers for – his his uh, practice time and Hoyer has some experience, but they don't. And even Brady struggled with with the relationships with these these receivers. So there's going to be an even greater uh, apparent issue with not only having that offensive line depth problem, and hopefully that gets remedied quickly, but they're going to have that that lack of chemistry with these receivers, especially with a a young uh, quarterback and a quarterback who's been in and out of the program for, you know, all pushing 10 years at this point. Um, so that's going to further build onto that. They need to get the ball out quickly problem. If, if that offensive line problem persists. I would also add one thing to that in a different off season program, because the facilities are still closed. You can't go there. It's going to be a virtual off-season program, which to me seems like playbook stuff and concept and scheme stuff, but it doesn't allow you the opportunity to go out and work with your receivers and get that timing and that trust and that progression that you need over the course of a training camp and into the season. Yeah, I, I agree. To me, I agree with you that offensive lineman is an offensive lineman is needed, but I, I still – you don't. You draft a lineman in the first round, but you also don't. I feel like the Patriots are going to take a skill position player in the first round at twenty three. I just get that feeling. I mean, I might be wrong, but I get that feeling. 
I mean, they could they could certainly benefit from you know some wide receiver depth as well. I mean, we I guess a lot of us always could, um, and there are certainly some targets out there for them. If but again, it comes down to the problem of well, now you got a, a rookie receiver out there who doesn't have any, uh, but that's going to be the problem with any rookie, of course. So that that very well could be a target as well, um, especially with. Uh, all of our issues, even with with veterans, you know, like Antonio Brown and Demarius Thomas coming in and leaving quite quickly, and then Mohamed Sanu coming in, and we, you know, you think he's going to be the cure all almost, and it seems like him and Brady could never get on that same page. I I, I have to throw, throw this out there before we move on to our next topics of of the draft. What do you think of say Tua Tagovailoa coming to New England? If they if he's still there, or they trade up to get him? I'm not sure. I'm still not entirely sure how sold I am on Tua. I mean, I'm not going to say he's bad. I'm not going to say he's uh, anything like that. There is clear evidence that he ha- is successful and has skill. But for some reason, I just don't see him working. There's just something about it. And I can't even point out a distinct reason why, to be honest. Um, I could not see him walking in New England for whatever reason. There's just something in me that doesn't scream a fit to me. Fair enough. I would add a reason, although not necessarily your reason, but he's injury prone. He's proven that at Alabama. And the SEC is great. Don't get me wrong. The SEC is the best conference in college football. And you face pro guys there every week, but you're not facing a team full of pro guys. Mm -hmm. In the NFL, you are. Every week, every single person on that team is a professional athlete. And their job is to do one thing, hunt you down and make you hurt. And I certainly hope for his sake, whoever drafts him takes that into account. And and, and by that, I mean takes his health into account. They need to – if they draft him, they should not throw him into the pit immediately. And I I say I hope that happens, but I almost, I almost feel that whoever picks him up, they – he will be right into the frying pan, and and that's not good for a guy coming off of a, a pretty devastating injury. And I mean, especially for recovering so quickly. That's what I think I'm impressed about the most: uh, the the medical skill that came into that. But it's still something to worry about, especially when you when you when you pick him up. You need to know that he's had that injury, and you should probably take care of that and not throw him out there. I'm not into slandering franchises, but let's be honest. If he goes to Miami, he's going to get thrown in the deep end immediately. They're going to they're going to they're going to toss him in, and they're going to they're going to throw Josh Rosen at the corner. I I believe that, and I I'm especially because I mean I don't see that Miami even really has a lot of confidence in him. They picked him up, you know, of course, but maybe just because he was a good deal. But I don't know. I don't know if anybody would have much confidence in him at this point. Then again, he also was uh, not in the greatest uh, setup for success when when he played with Arizona. Not that Arizona is is absolute garbage fire or something, but there are certain systems that just seem to not work very well with a lot of rookies. They're building something in Arizona. I fully believe that. Because I think Cliff Kingsbury and Kyler Murray will have a some sort of, not necessarily a Brady Josh McDaniels con, uh, connection, but I think they'll have a really good connection, and I think they'll use that. They don't have David Johnson anymore. They have DeAndre Hopkins and Larry Fitzgerald. That's mm-hmm. an offense that if you if you do it right, can scare a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, you exactly. You've got receivers that are veterans, especially in in Larry Fitzgerald, and then you've got. One of the most sure-handed receivers in DeAndre Hopkins of the last few years. So, if they if they play their cards right, then and everything falls perfectly, even slightly imperfectly, I think they'll be on the up. I agree with you. Uh, another topic I would uh, think about in, in in the draft is front seven help. How many guys from the front seven did they lose of in free agency and trades? They they had like look at the front seven now. Lawrence Guy, Adam Butler, John Simon, uh Shadik Shalik Calhoun, uh Jawan Bentley, Dante Hightower, and Chase Winovich. 
Mm-hmm. You need help. Yeah, I mean, considering you lost a, a wonderful player in, in Van Noy, and and he he likes he played that role a lot as well. So losing him to what Detroit, right? He went to no Calvin Ryan went to Miami. Oh, Miami, that's right. He came from Detroit first. Yeah, am I getting my? And there like we go. That midseason trade that looks like it proves Belichick's genius. Yeah. So you lose him, and he's been he's been a powerhouse, and you lose. You lost. They lost Duran Harmon. Of course, this is front seven, of course, but you lose Duran Harmon, uh, and they they're showing they they're pretty much they were willing to clean house. It seemed you almost wondered who's the next important player that that's going to be let go to another team or just straight up cut. And it, you got worried. You literally started getting that feeling that it's a rebuild. I mean, it's pretty much a rebuild here in its own way, but you really got it that feeling that they're willing to clean house and just totally rebuild entirely. Yeah, because and that, of how many players? Exactly. It's partially due to the cap space. I mean, I'm on over the cap.com now. Once it finishes loading, the Patriots have uh, in total cap space, one point two two nine million dollars to spend total in cap space. Wow. That's nothing. Yeah, that is that is That's not n- a lot of leeway. No, a- and one more point to uh, add in terms of the draft: you got to get a kicker. Gostowski's out. Yeah, they've they've got to they've got to. I mean, I who's who was the? I don't even remember who we end who they ended with. To be honest. Oh. Oh. There were so many that went through <laughs> that organization. I know more than more than I've seen in my history of watching the team. I don't even remember anymore. It's point. really sad. But um, that 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 to me is the um, is, is who hmm. you know how much they can uh, save by cutting um, uh, Stefan Gilmore before June one. Not that they will, but I'm just looking at the uh, contracted players have, on this. I have no idea. Uh, let, let's go with five million. I'm gonna guess three point three. They oh, can fine. save if they cut Dante Hightower before June. Work first, they can save nine million. <sighs> he might be the next cap to fall. <laughs> I love him, but he's injury prone. If they take a linebacker in this draft, look out. Just a heads he's, up. He has certainly had some issues, but. At the same time, he has made some phenomenal plays, and in the in we it, we all know what I'm referring to, the the big strip of Matt Ryan. Yeah, the one that turned the game. Yes. Well, that's our Patriots draft preview. Uh, let's talk about this from a WVU perspective because I did want to talk about. We mentioned Colton McKibbitts. As a West Virginia fan, let's talk about this in terms of looking at as a college fan of the NFL draft. Uh, is there any ex- – what's it like when you think a WVU player might be picked for you? I know it's like for me. Well, it's, this is a extremely uh, broad way to put it, but at the same time, it's like – you go to I, I I go to school with these people. I have no I have no interaction with them, of course. But at the same time, it's like I go to school with these people, and they're they're younger than me now. At this point, seeing a lot of draftees be younger than me makes me feel old, and <laughs> only twenty five. But but then you know, knowing that not only does someone from West Virginia University get drafted, um, it just it it kind of gives you a small sense of pride. For them, not only for them be going there, but also in the in the university and in the state. And I must say that I've, there's a lot of things that that I could use to boost my pride in in the state sometimes. Uh, but for sure, that it, it's a it is exciting. You know, when you when you saw Yadni Kajus name come up last year, I was like, especially seeing him go to the Patriots. Both of us were probably screaming in person, and as well as as typing out collective woos and then immediately after that seeing Will Greer come off the board two Mountaineers in a row both of us being excited but also disappointed because we're like we you wanted him you wanted him to go to New England I have a friend who's a Giants fan who loves to talk smack to me anytime he gets a chance uh so he was and he loves Will Greer we all love Will Greer 
And he was like, he shared the Panthers announcing the pick. And I got real mad. I said, I hope we beat him in the Super Bowl and leave him to die. You know, I was just like, I, I, didn't, <laughs> I got so mad. I was just like, okay, I'm done. I do recall that. Yep. I, I was hoping he would be the heir apparent to Brady. I really was because I'm thinking, okay, he's the kind of player quarterback you can develop over the course of a year. He, he's got, he can make every throw. He's got what you want. And honestly, with the Panthers being in a rebuild, I'm hoping they ship him up to Boston, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, the, uh, there's the Drop King Murphy's house. reference. <laughs> yeah, they're cleaning house there in, in, in a little bit in Carolina as well with – no, the Matt New Rule there be- now. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, that's right. I totally had forgot that he had been hired. Yeah, it was really weird looking at him coming from Baylor. He was in for the Colts job before uh, McDaniel's got it, and then when they gave it to Frank Reich, and then I guess the NFL still wanted him, obviously, and then he went into Carolina. And I don't know how they're going to be there, but I know they're going to be interesting because of uh, Christian McCaffrey. You you got a running back in the prime of his career. In a rebuild, that's always interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that uh, yeah, now the highest paid running back in history, which is good for him for one, get that money. Uh, but yeah, it it also makes you wonder how much. Well, one, how much cap space do they have? Uh, I can gotta, find out. I I close because, the window. <laughs> I'm an idiot they, sometimes. I always, I, I always, you know, uh, you get happy for the players, and they're like, yeah. They they deserve money, but at the same time you're like, now what does that do for the team? <laughs> really, that's my uh, other. That's my first thought afterwards. Is now how does this help the team other than keeping that player? But how does this help them in the long run? Well, let's see. The Panthers have in cap space seven point one million. Okay, so they got a bit of room to work with. It seems not not a crazy amount, but at least they some. are paying their offense so much more than their defense. They're paying the offense ninety point five ninety. Excuse me, ninety million dollars and seventy three million for the uh, defense. Wow, it doesn't usually how much it doesn't usually bow well. Does that account for any money that um it might be tied up in? I think that does account for dead cap space. I think. Okay, because so I don't know how much he was hit. Let's see, for, here, but... who's the dead money leader? Oh, Matt Khalil is the dead money leader with over nine nine point eight million in dead money. That's a lot of money to be paying be paying a guy. Yeah. I'm going to look and see what the Patriots have in terms of their um, their offense and defense split because I'm really interested to see how that uh, pays out. Now, okay. W- well, this is not unexpected. Offense is being paid 91.3. Defense is being paid 93.6. So fairly even. Yeah, give or take $2 million. I, I I'm certainly not going to complain about that. If you look at the highest players, it's Stephon. Highest paid players is Stephon Gilmore, Joe Tooney, Dante Hightower, Julian Edelman, and Marcus Cannon in the top five. That's fairly balanced. Mm-hmm. Just to wrap up the draft, the Patriots have the following selections in the in the NFL draft. Uh, pick round one, pick twenty three. They don't have a second round pick, although I would expect them to get one because I just know how Bill operates. He trades a lot, even in even in a virtual draft, he'll probably do at least one or two trades. Pick number 87, 98, 100, 125, 172, 195, 204, 212, 213, 230, and 241. T- picks 98, 100, 212, and 213 are compensatory picks, meaning they can't trade them. They will be picking those picks. So that's that's my that's the Patriots draft. I actually didn't I was reading this on Patriots.com, but I ran off the um the the depth chart and the draft picks. They did a Patri- they did a draft primer, and this is under the passing on a selection um, section of this. I found this very interesting. If a team does not make a pick during its allotted time period, the team passes and the pick will be deferred to the next team. The initial team may then at any point make a pick, regardless of whether or not the subsequent team has made a pick. That's interesting. Hmm. Now that that kind of gets into the, what if there are communication issues? Yeah. If there are issues there, you're essentially screwing a team out of a pick that, and that over an issue that they can't help. Um, which I would hope someone communicates that in another way pretty quickly. Hey, I've got this issue, and they've got another mean of communication. But let's say they don't. 
that does quickly get down into a lot of people might get uh, uh, unfair advantages almost, if you want to put it that way. Basically, I mean, if you're looking at what is a normal war room in the draft, it's the head coach, the GM, or in the Patriots case, it's Bill Belichick who serves as both the owner and then position coaches and, you know, gut and scouts. So you've got a lot of people in there doing this stuff. And so you've got to find a way for the scout that saw this kid play in college in like October to communicate to someone who, let's be honest, I would think since Bill Belichick comes from a scouting background and his dad, he's fairly uh, involved in this, but he had a team to coach for the last fall. He didn't have a chance to go out and see every game this kid played. So you're going to have a scout that knows the kid better and to Bill, I think we should take him. And if Bill hired him, he has a reason to trust him. So I would think he would go with it unless his gut says something. But you've got to have that connection. And that's one of the things that everyone was screaming about, you know, how are we going to get this? And then John Harbaugh, the Ravens coach, said, well, what happens if a team, you know, can hack into my draft board or my communication? And I think he was looking at the team in Foxborough, Mass., when he said that, I think probably. Oh, probably. Um, one thing I think, so here's one thing, this is a slight offshoot, but still draft related that I think might be interesting to end on just because it's not like sure. a, an unexpected thing, but also just a thing that I hadn't thought about. So they, they unsurprisingly, they, the NFL has told the potential draftees um, what they can and can't wear. And that's unsurprising in its own way. Basically, it's what you would expect if it was you know, a high school or you know, something like that where you don't wear you know, explicit language, uh, anything racial or, or yeah. ethnic or violent, basically any of that stuff. It also – and these are things specifically that I hadn't quite thought about that I never really noticed when watching the – draft um they also pretty much say that if you are if you happen to be on camera make sure you're not wearing brand logos that aren't associated with the nfl so don't go wearing or adidas you know, or Jordan, Under Armour probably or, yeah because they would do uh, it like they want to do yeah like. yep so don't do that uh don't have any pharmaceutical products like let's say gronk was in the draft and yep. he was dealing with his oh, yeah. cbd company that he's you can't be wearing that uh and also uh, uh now this is something i hadn't thought about and i don't know if this is an overall the nfl is against them type thing or if they just don't have any set sponsorships um but they're also saying um nothing nutritional substance related and normally that's in the form of energy drinks that are almost always touted as these substances like bang and and uh rain monsters compete or, or comp- competitor sorry um and i mean even monster itself really um so huh. that's something i hadn't thought about i had never really i don't know if they have anything established or if they just are straight I, up against them but that mm. wouldn't be surprising um and then also um the last couple things are uh no coke products uh don't have a can of Coke in front of you. Don't have any – if you don't have your AirPods in, if you know AirPods are so popular, but don't have them in your ear. Make sure you're either not oh, using yeah. them or you're wearing bows. Uh, so it's essentially – they even – now here's the interesting part that, that – on if that wasn't interesting, here's uh, something that I see. It says that – and I'm on – this is an article on AOL shared from Yahoo Sports, uh, by the way, if anybody wants to look that up. Um it says that the draftees, the draftees obviously must comply if they were to appear on camera, um, even though none of them signed a contract. Again, not surprising. But apparently the NFL is helping them out uh, by shipping the dra- potential draftee a, a welcome kit of products that are approved hmm. for the NFL. So if they were to wear something, essentially it's saying, hey, hey, wear this. It's like, it's like an endorsement without because an it, endorsement. It, 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 I'm not saying it happens as much anymore because the NFL, I would think, has a pretty good wrangle on what teams are thinking about. And they know who they invited to the combine. Mm -hmm. But what if they pick a guy that you don't really think they're going to pick? Or let's say a guy you thought would be drafted in like round six or round seven passes and becomes an undrafted free agent. 
and then some guy you thought would be an undrafted guy is picked, you know? Or is this – or because we don't really show I – mean, yeah. you've seen the final day of the drafts on TV. They're talking, doing everything else, and then they'll scroll the pick down at the bottom of the screen. They don't really take a lot of the time like they do – like ESPN has the ESPN NFL crew on the network, and then on ABC they're having a college game day crew do their um, – do their version of like basically college game day from the draft from the college football perspective. So they'll jump in to guys like if Joe Burrow gets taken at number one, they'll go to his house. And then if two were goes, they'll, you know, down the line. But I wonder how many they're doing that for, because at some point they stop, but I don't remember when they stop. Cause it's, it's, it's draft. It's round one on Thursday, round two and three on Friday, and then four through seven on Saturday. So when do they stop? Mm-hmm. You know, because that's a lot Christian. of money to ship out to two hundred fifty-six guys. There are two hundred, however, however many people. Are, yeah, however yeah. many people are drafted. Especially depending, especially depending on yeah, especially depending on how many they happen to you know exactly. what things happen to be included in those kits. Like, there's nothing on here that says sure. it just says and they're quote, not quote welcome and they're gonna kit. let you find out by watching. So I'm like, gonna tell you now. Mm-hmm. And it also, it also makes me wonder. So, I guess probably the final point in terms of clothing wear and stuff. Um, I mean, if they're doing these, so there's right. There's no no one is in contact with anyone, right? No one's this player is not shaking the hands of the uh, yes. Goodell or anybody else. Um, how it makes me really wonder how they they will be doing the hey wear the hat. You know, of the team that you've now, the, the draft cap of the team you've now been picked up by. Because I mean, it it, it also it does. It make almost me a sounds curious. like it could be it's like, like will the they National have that Day thing, they just have a- where the kid has like three hats and he picks from one. It almost seems like they could have um, like the NFL in that welcome package could send you thirty two hats and then hey, find the one that picked you or. You know, like if you get a call, like let's say Bill Belichick calls you and say we're going to make you a Patriot, you go have your mom or whoever go find the Patriots hat and put it on. Yeah, that that could that could very well be what they do, and that I'd be interested to see, um, because I mean obviously no one would know that they're picked, uh, you know who they're picked by in advance. I mean I would assume they don't unless there's some. Thing well, going usually on with that number one know, overall but... picks, there's, it generally <laughs> comes out like. Okay, we're recording this on Tuesday. So on Wednesday, tomorrow, or Thursday before the draft starts, it wouldn't shock me if like Schefter or Glazer or or Florio or someone in like the big NFL uh, reporters broke the story that either Joe Burrow will be picked by the mm-hmm. by the Bengals or they're trading the pick. It usually would number one comes out before the draft. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they almost always know exactly who's going to be number one well before the draft, and they're almost always right. And I mean, they they pretty much touted Baker quite quite early, and it didn't seem to. I mean, there was even some of the ones that were saying, "Oh, he might not be the first. And then obviously, that, that it's very up. interesting. I, I'm I'm looking for something. Heck, I wouldn't be surprised when I turn my when I stop recording this and check my phone again. I wouldn't be shocked if I saw something that says. Joe Burrow confirming one number one at Cincinnati. It wouldn't shock me. <laughs> but let's let's wrap up the draft. And true. as Bill Belichick will say, we're on to uh, we're on to the next one. Uh, the next one is the big one: Tom Brady leaving. Okay, so if you're a Patriots fan, grab your comfort blanket. We're going to have a deep conversation here. You know, grab everything you need to get through this. Tom Brady, the six-time Super Bowl champion. I'm going to regret saying that. Uh, who is costing the Patriots thirteen and a half million dollars dead cap money this year? Yeah. So Ouch. you and I were both in the same location when uh, we found out Brady was leaving. I actually told you, and I called it. Said one of us was going to be able to tell the other. I called it. We were with our friend Brian mm-hmm. Sick Ninja B and B, who has been on the previous iteration of this podcast. And if you know anything about New England Patriots or West Virginia, we have him on, but he doesn't. So it would be next to useless. Um, but we were both there. He was doing a YouTube shoot, and I remember what my reaction was. I was kind of numb for a little while. I was trying to process it all. What was your reaction when I told you it happened? 
I, it was it was kind of the pessimist in me in its own way, immediately assuming that all of these reports that he was probably going to be gone were right. I didn't want to like say, oh yeah, they totally have to be right because you know I'm always skeptical. But the pessimist in me was like, oh, he's gone. He's going to be gone, and Lucas and I are going to be standing there consoling each other the minute it happens. Um, and just as you called it. That day, while we were at the shoot, you you find out. Oh, yep, he's gone. He's he is leaving. Um, so it was it was extremely sad in its own way because while obviously none of us know these these players like personally, we've literally that he's the only quarterback in that we've known <laughs> the entire time we've watched this team. So it's a, even even minus the four games that he was out um, and the whole season he was out with his ACL. But consistently it was the one quarterback that you pretty much knew. Oh yeah. Next season watching him again. Well, we'll be watching him, but ideally getting his oh, butt handed to him by fun. Drew Brees two, two times, a, uh, two times a year. Um, and that's just because I've always liked to see, Drew Brees whip up on people, uh, but I do. I am looking forward to that showdown. And we get twice a year. One too. way or the other, it's going to be exciting. Um, Instead of once every four yes. years, I, I agree with you. I mean, I like you said, it was the only person, it was the only quarterback outside of Matt Castle and Jimmy Garoppolo that we'd known as a starter for the Patriots. But I, I'm with you. I didn't want to face the music that he was leaving, but I think in, in my heart of hearts, I knew he was gone. Because I, I, why else would you opt out of a, of the last two years of a three year contract if you're just if you're going to stay? Why would you do that unless you really just want to play it for more money? Yeah. And you knew that they weren't going to. I mean, this is the organization that doesn't pay people more money. They just don't. Why did Vandy Moss get kicked out of town? Mm-hmm. He wanted more money. He asked about his contract. That's the reason why. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. I, I I'm with you. I think it was it, it was very. It was really hard to kind of admit it because it's just like, well, there goes that last you know, 20 years or so. It almost felt like it, it went down the drain, but it didn't. It just kind of felt like it. Yeah. And then, you know, both of us at the time at that point until, you know, news started breaking and, you know, all this stuff, we, we were both like, you know what? Uh, thank you. Obviously, thanks for everything. Wonderful time, you know sucks that it happened this way, wish we just retired, all these things, essentially. Um, but then, obviously, these things come out. He goes yep. on the Howard Stone show, right? Howard Stone? Yeah. Um, and then pretty much says, oh, yeah, I knew I was gone before the season even started. That's when you felt that moment of betray- If you were a Patriots fan, you should have felt betrayed from that. Um, and it's, I'm not going to say you're wrong if you didn't feel betrayed, but I feel like a majority of the Patriots fans felt betrayed because of that statement. You knew you were leaving and you pretty much led them on most of us on for most of the time, especially with, like you mentioned that particular advertisement. He even led bill on when they met uh, before he left, bill went in with the assumption that he was staying. He let his head coach on. I mean, and what, even if you're Mm -hmm. mad, even if you've grown tired of him, what kind of person is willing to let an organization that took a chance on him in on, in the sixth round at a point where he was getting ready to become an insurance salesman if it didn't work out? And, and what kind of person just sits there and lets an organization go on without having an opportunity to draft your replacement adequately unless he really thinks that Stidham is the guy? But let's just say Stidham isn't for whatever reason. What kind of person you could have gone, Coach, it's been great. You know, you could have done that before the year, and then you could have had scouts going, okay, look for a quarterback. You know? Mm-hmm. And at least and at least everyone would have known he, this is last season with, with the team, whether it's with the team or just in the NFL. They would have known. Everyone would have known, and it wouldn't be such a – it would have been a bombshell at the time, but there wouldn't have been this unsatisfying buildup for him to just yeah, leave and, and go to trademarking TB times TB and uh, Tampa Bay and just it's it, it's and 
<laughs> I've just got to say it's those really are hard. extremely cheesy. I don't care. Now he did he did bring up a funny point, um, uh, which is also cheesy. In the same time when I saw that on Twitter, uh, he he stated, "Now if only Drew Brees oh, yeah, would uh, trademark too. Drew Orleans, Orleans or Drew Orleans." So, and I was like, but "That's cheese. That's as cheesy." Here's as Here's the be, thing: but if he did, they'd funny, sell out but, in like five minutes. Yeah. And then you have oh, yeah. Sean Payton has to come up with something incredibly sure. cheesy, and then we just start going down the line of coaches and quarterbacks introducing cheesy merchandise. Yeah, and then we'd be, we'd be it, essentially the NFL would, if it hasn't already become a meme in its own way, would have been uh, definitely be a meme from all of that. You'd see the cheesiest dad jokes on, and NFL then you'd have Cliff Kingsbury going, seen. "Wait, what? I'm the young guy. What? What's happening?" It's like, you guys are making money? Oh, boy. Warning, there might be memes in this show. Just a warning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, should you take one of these audio outtakes yeah. as a meme? That's we come from, trust me, when we get off this, we're going <laughs> to jump into a meme sharing group with our best friend Brian and his brother Michael and his other brother Brandon. We'll join this all day. <laughs> so let's yes, – I don't want to start crying again because I know I'm going to we'll talk about Brady enough. We're going to move on. We're going to wrap up this show with the last point I want to make, <laughs> and at least in topic discussion. The new uniforms the Patriots unveiled yesterday. Love, hate, somewhere between your thoughts, sir. Um, well, I got to say I was surprised mostly because I didn't expect that they would, they would adopt essentially the color wash uniform. Um, I expected it to be you know, some slight alteration of the already existing one like they've done over the years, you know, with the change in the logo and things like that. Um, I I don't hate it. I, I'm kind of – I expected something different. Um, I, I do say, which I mentioned yesterday when that news broke, uh, I'm not sure I like the stripes on the away jersey. Um, they might grow on me, uh, but I'm not sure I like them at this moment. But overall, I'm fine with the adoption of the color rush. Um, they're not ugly Josies. They don't look like a three-year-old created them as a York homework Jets. project in pre-K or something. Um, <laughs> Atlanta. <laughs> so they look, but but uh, I, I I did expect something different. I, I was kind of surprised by that. But I'm sure I'm sure those stripes will grow on me. But right now, I'm still not. Quite so. You know what the white jersey remind me of when I thought about a little bit more? The Bears' white jerseys, but that stripe. Hmm. Yeah, and I don't actually, like, I don't gotta, hate the Bears' uniforms at all. I really don't. I, I, and, I think the Bears' uniforms look halfway decent. I, I can't disagree with that. In, they're, they're, they are solid uniforms. You um, know what I expected from this uniform? I was kind of surprised they did the color rush. I expected them to take the, uh, the, um, the gray uh, around the armpit from the jersey and just make that all blue. That's what I thought they were going to do. Because it said minor alterations to the jersey. They didn't say. And it isn't as drastic as other teams have done, but that's why mm-hmm. I thought. I thought they were going to make it all blue like Tampa did and then just kind of go from there. Which yeah, they kind of did. Yeah, that would have been interesting. The, uh, the, one thing, the one thing I think I will end on with the jerseys, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna... to... I'm going to do a little call out and not in, 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 a, in a joking way, uh, mostly. Um, Stefan Gilmore, yeah. don't put your white jersey <laughs> on the ground, dude. He opens the box and up, then puts goes, on the ground. that's an icy jersey. Sits it on the front of his, just right on the ground, on the cobblestone or whatever that was. We're going like, to have Come on, to, man. It might be, but we're going to Can I say that? I Is that trademark? I said, uh... I said the big game three times, so. <laughs> but you're right. It was really kind of like... Show us how you really feel, Stefan. Show us how you really feel. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's like icy and then puts it on the ground. Do you like it? Do you hate it? Now now I can't tell. You've got some kind of now let me, let me, let me, going on. Let me here. go crazy, <laughs> kooky, conspiracy theorist, dude, because I am capable of doing that. They changed the road uniform completely. It's a complete and total rebuild. But the color rush is effectively what is the home uniform now. Can we draw that line of, yeah, one of the two is gone, Brady, but Bill's still here. We still got half that duo. You know, there's that kind of, there's that kind of underlying symbolism yeah. kind of thing. 
that's true. I mean, you, he's made he's made something out of nothing for uh, a lot of nothings for quite a few years. I it wouldn't surprise me if if they were to keep that trend up this season and they'd be. I like can give never, you two examples. You know, Two thousand eight, when Brady got went down with the uh, with with the ACL. And then 2001, Brady's first season as starter mm-hmm. when he wasn't yet Tom Brady. That team went 11 and 5 and went to the Super Bowl and won it. And there's a third. Okay. And went to the big game and won it. You know, those are two times where Bill Belichick has taken nothing and, and he got a bye in 01 and he missed the playoffs by like a half game, a tiebreaker in 08. This everyone thinking mm-hmm. this is going to be the pages falling off a cliff has not watched the Patriots over the last twenty years, and doesn't know Belichick. He built a winner in Cleveland exactly. before he got fired, and they moved to Baltimore. He built a winner there. He, they struggled to begin with, but once he got his guys in there, he built them. They were like eleven and five his last year. And by the way, have you have you ever, have you seen the guys on the? his staff in Cleveland? Yeah. No. Nick We've Saban, referring to like a coaching Nick tree Nick was his defensive coordinator. Kirk Ferentz, the head coach at Iowa, ah. was, his, uh, was there. Uh, Eric Mangini, I think, was there. Uh, hold on. I've got the uh, 1995 mm. Browns coaching staff on, on here. I think it's 95 Browns, I think. <sighs> Okay, here we go. 95 Browns. This is from NFL Films on NFL.com. This is the uh, 95. Okay, there's Belichick. Austin Newsom grew up to be the GM of the uh, Ravens and won a super and won big games there. I'm gonna, we're going to end up on the NFL a lot of money. Scott <laughs> Pioli came to New England and built the first team. Mike Tannenbaum, former Jets head GM. Jim Schwartz, uh, former Lions head coach. Kirk Ferentz, uh, current Iowa head coach. Thomas Dimitrov, uh, form, uh, current Falcons GM. Saban, we all know who he is. Eric Mangini. Uh, Phil Savage. I don't know who he is, but I know he, uh, let's see. Remember the Ravens following the move eventually returned to Cleveland as GM. Okay. He, uh, he picked Braylon Edwards in 05. Michael Lombardi, um, of uh, a respected uh, front office person. The point is Bill Belichick can build staffs and he can build football teams. That's the point. That's one of the, mm-hmm. That might be the best staff Definitely. ever assembled, period. It very well might. And I didn't know this. The uh, New York football giants at one point had Vince Lombardi and Tom Landry as assistant coaches. I watched that, uh, I don't think Peyton's I was ever aware of on ESPN, and they were talking about uh, Vince Lombardi, uh, and I didn't know that Landry and Lombardi were on that same staff. Two of the greatest coaches in the history of the game were on the same staff. Wow. As assistants. The, the last game Definitely Vince Lombardi ever was an assistant for the Giants as was the greatest game ever played against the Baltimore Colts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Uh, while we're at it, I remember more of that episode. You know how uh, players and coaches have like the Microsoft tablets that used to have like the the pictures coming down from the uh, from the from the booth. Vince Lombardi started that. Mm-hmm. Uh, he uh, I wasn't aware he of that started either. it by because uh, they played in the in the old Yankee Stadium before they built the new one. Um, so he was an army before he went to the Giants, and they did something like that. And so they didn't do that in the Giants, and so they decided – he's like, well, we got to have this. They're doing it in college. Why is it in the NFL? And so the, uh, he wanted someone to volunteer to do it. The Giants owner – I think his name was Wellington Mara. It was Mara. I don't remember what his first name was. I think it's Wellington. Volunteered. He put the uh, Polaroids in a sock and threw the sock down onto the sideline or a shoe. And that's how we got to – that's the start of coaches getting the, the pictures and then now with the tablets and they have with Microsoft having the, um, having the film there for them. 
It's crazy. This game, that's why we both love this game. There's so much to learn. There's so much to enjoy with it. At least for me. Definitely. Well, I think that just oh, about does it for this show today. We will be back next week with our draft review. We're going to try to fit more WVU into this because this was a Patriots heavy show. But again, I think you'll both, I think anyone listening will understand as to why it was a Patriots heavy show because the NFL draft is, is this week. You don't have a whole lot of WVU stuff going around. I mean, you've got, uh, well, let's see, nothing because they close everything down. So you've got – all you had was the – would have been spring game on Saturday, and I'm still bummed over that. I'm still really, really bummed that I didn't get a chance to watch a spring game. I was going to try to go up there because, well, why not? My brother goes there. If he was still in school, I was going to go, hey, Dad, let's go watch the spring game and go see Chase. Plus, it means, some, it means something to me because uh, yep, the donations there go to Booby Memorial, the Children's Hospital, you. And my life was kind of saved to that hospital. So it means a lot to me to go up and support every chance I get. Well, I agree. It would be, it was uh, slightly sad to not see. They did. Uh, but they did, they did do a lot of reruns of old ones, especially the old. They did the, the old uh, Slayton, Slayton 04 or 03 win against ones, Virginia Tech. Was, that kind of announced that WVU was about to burst on the national scene. Uh, I didn't watch a ton of that because mm-hmm. I was doing other stuff, but I did see that they did do that. You know what I game I could really go for watching right now? The Fiesta Bowl. Which one? That I have a friend of mine. Extremely their, fun to watch. They're twins. Their dad was watching that the other day, and I almost – if he wasn't living in Savannah, Georgia, I was going to say, hey, hold a spot for me. I'll be right there. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I guess sure. the quick yeah. thing before we uh, before we super end, since uh, we yeah. I guess we push it <laughs> off because we we like to talk. Uh, the last thing, um, I was probably uh, the closest one could possibly get to being at the Orange Bowl when they went to the Orange Bowl, and I, I'll explain that by so my dad had um, at the time he was still in the army, uh, but apparently there was some programs. Uh, I can't remember the exact uh, in scenario for right off the top of my head, but the point is he could have gotten two tickets and a, basically a really inexpensive bus ride down to that game, um, and all he would have had to do is you know pay for a hotel. And uh, for some reason, he did not take that offer. <laughs> and he told me, I think he told me he was thinking about it, and then oh, for man. some reason decided against it. But I could have been at the Orange Bowl game and missed out. That, Obviously, I that day it, was really fun for me, and you made me think there. about it. Um, <laughs> that was January 4th, 2012. Uh, I came home from school. It was a school day. It was like my first, that was like the third day back from class or whatever. And so. Uh, my favorite Premier League Premier League team, Everton, were playing a midweek game that day. Uh, my favorite player of Everton at that time was a goalkeeper named Tim Howard. He scored that day, and I think and Everton lost the game in pure Everton fashion. Uh, but I just feel I think when uh, and I was all obviously ready for that game. I'm thinking, okay, BCS ball game. Here we go. We're gonna we're gonna really get it this time. But I think when I saw Tim Howard score, I'm like. For some odd reason, I thought West Virginia could actually win this game. If Tim Howard can score, West Virginia can win the game. And it was almost kind of that moment where you're going, all right, well, we'll, we'll see what happens. And I just remember that second quarter just piled on, and I'm like, we're going to win the game. We're going to win the game. And we did, and it was just so exciting. So that's my Orange Bowl memory. But we can get it. We can make a whole, sto- a whole show. We probably will clear on nothing else to talk about after the draft about our favorite WVU memories, which is why I'm kind of not speaking <laughs> mine here. But I do remember that specific day. I'm looking at that going, okay, he scored. We can actually win this game now. <sighs> Let's see here. Ooh. Yeah, that'll be fun. I don't know why. I was still on uh, uh, cap spa- over the cap.com. I was looking at Brady's $13.5 million uh, cap hit for the Patriots. Take a guess at what his cap hit is for the Bucks. 
Mm, yep. Let's see. So million. he what signed twenty five million a dollar a year deal? Yeah, like, twenty five million uh, for this it, year. It wasn't a year, right? It was just so, twenty five million yeah. total. Okay, for this year. So it, the it is twenty five. Cap hit. Yeah, so he's he's not good. Hmm. He's got, but he has to. Hit it would them. be twenty five. Yeah, technically, so he's got bonuses yeah, unless... in his deal. Let's see. Yeah. So hmm. Yeah. If they cut him post June one, let's see. It doesn't get anything to gain. I don't think it saved the whole contract. <laughs> what happens if they trade him? <laughs> they save twenty five. <laughs> well. I mean, I think. Oh, the I know. Contract, yeah, that's why he uh, did it. He's like, I'm not going to. that said, you I'm can't not going to get out of here. And he's. Did you see yeah. what he got uh, in trouble in Tampa yesterday? So he's living in Derek Jeter's old mansion, uh, which is super. No, ironic. I did he, not. He played in Boston. He's living in a former New York Yankees mansion. That's just beyond ironic. But apparently, <laughs> he couldn't find anywhere to work out, so he went in public, Jeez. and he got in trouble for that. Yeah. It's like a former like athlete's he, fan. You're in a mansion. You can't find a place to work like, out. Come on. places to work out. <laughs> like, listen, with all of this pliability and all these workout programs he has, and they're even doing virtual it, workout like, programs it, for their customers. None of that, you can't do that yourself, guys. I don't guy. know why I didn't Come just on. stay in Boston and around where TV12 is. I really don't. It's like, you don't have to be down there until like June, July anyway. Why wouldn't you just stay there if you know this virus is coming and he should know because he's not playing right now. He has connection with the outside world. Oh, that's true. But this is also the same guy that says you can drink, what, 12 gallons of water a day or some high, some crazy amount of water a day. And like, you know, it has extreme health benefits. That, or something. that is He's true. He's got some very questionable health advice. True. Isn't it crazy? That now, I would never you know, take. He's our quarterback. We're sort of brainwashed. <laughs> now he's not. And we're like, how crazy is he? Yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely so did I. Be kind of when accepted. He was it. there. I knew for sure that there were some crazy things. Like, <laughs> he... oh yeah, I accepted it. And I was like, listen, he's just here to win games. He's here to play a game. He's not here to sell yeah. me health I'm advice. Buying I'm not jersey, buying it. Not anymore. <laughs> I'm buying the football. <laughs> but it's like but I'm going to take I'm this either. line from I'm not buying his football. And I'm not buying his program. <laughs> How many people you think will take the new uh, away jersey and put Brady 12 on the back of it? A good bit. Yeah. And they, they have too the many. color rush, or at least they, they should by for now. Sure. Um, it's been around for two years. But it's like they're going to do it, and we just it's a matter of when, not if. Oh, Mm-hmm. I guarantee you. It'll like, cost them a little extra it, money to do it, but then they'll as, probably do it. As long as the Patriots are in business, there's going to be someone putting Brady 12 on the back of a jersey. And, and it's just, even if they don't, uh, even if they never saw mm-hmm. him play, like even if our kids who never saw him play, they'll go, I want a Brady 12, you know? And it's just like, at that point, I'm going to go, all right, you want it? Pay for it yourself. I'm not doing it. Yeah. No, seriously, I was going to name – I have always been asked what I'm going to name that kid <laughs> if I had a boy and I always said Brady. And I'm like, i got to rethink that now. I'm serious. I stopped. Like, I'm just not. No. I've got to find something <laughs> else. Patrick for Pat White. There we go. Down it. <laughs> oh. Well, Darren, there we go. it's been a pleasure. Uh, we'll do this next week, and we'll see what we think of the draft. Hopefully, we'll be, uh, hopefully it runs smooth. It doesn't glitch like the, it happened when the Bengals did their uh, first pick in the virtual draft. We'll see. I just want to hear the, the music yeah. that they do to announce the picks. So I have that in my head and it just like, give me the real thing. I need it. Oh, I can only. I'm, I'm for sure going I to can be only imagine what picking you are going what to be I can. Each other on that night. Uh, to be like, listen, this should have went smooth. Or, I mean, then again. <laughs> yeah. I also have to try to try to peek out the um the the faces of the people, like how they're actually reacting in in not yeah. being there. I want to yeah, see I am too. 
how that might that'll be have, fun might uh well bottom line I'm is curious. you know i'll talk about It'll it over the course of the next about. week and then we will talk about it physically speak about it next week so until then this has been scientific coaching number one i'm lucas berry and for darren shrewsbury jr we will see you next week